I'm so sorry, ma'am. I know you need this medicine, but it looks like it's not covered by your insurance. Yeah, unfortunately, I had to deny that one. Wait, who are you? I'm your insurance company's pharmacy benefit manager. I get paid based on the price of a medicine, and I don't make as much money off this one. No one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark, and I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker, who writes the Substack newsletter Notes from the Middle Ground, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Our special guest this week is Nicholas Grossman, professor of political science at the University of Illinois and senior editor at ARC Digital. Welcome, one and all. Well, we began to discuss it last week because we knew that it was imminent, but now we have it. The indictment, the federal indictment of Donald Trump, First time in history that a president has been federally indicted. And as several wags on Twitter have pointed out, Trump has now been indicted more often than he has been elected. So we have 37 felony counts. And it is a very serious document laying out in rather devastating detail Trump's contempt for the law and endangerment of national security. So what about the reaction, everyone wants to know, by the Republicans? Well, there have been the usual clowns who have rallied round Trump, like Vivek Ramaswamy and, alas, Kevin McCarthy. But there have also been other voices that have been a little different from what we've come to see in the last eight years. We've had quite a few Republicans pushing back and stressing that this is very serious. So Nick Grossman, I'm going to start with you. Do you agree with me that the change in tone, at least among a number of Republicans, is notable for this particular indictment? I think so, yes. And in particular, we are seeing the national security Republicans, the ones who take it seriously and didn't already leave the party over Trump in various ways that he was undermining U.S. national security, but who were taking this seriously. That when it comes to a question like, is it okay when the Pentagon makes war plans for, say, the event of conflict with Iran, that the U.S. government try to keep that secret? I think just about everybody would agree in the abstract that, yes, of course, they can try to keep that secret and make various laws that try to prevent people from or discourage people from doing really careless things like stealing them and then showing them to reporters who don't have clearance. And that is what Trump is on tape doing. This isn't just like little keepsakes. What he's allegedly took that's in the indictment is really serious national security plans, that these are the very things that it is reasonable to classify and to make people seeing them illegal to have various criminal restrictions on them. And so we see figures like, for example, Bill Barr, the former attorney general, who did a lot to defend Trump when he was in office, but has been quite open about how just about any attorney general would charge this. These are very obviously serious crimes. It's not being politicized. Of course, war plans belong to the government, not to one guy who isn't even a government official anymore. And so when we see this split between them, I think most Republicans still seem to be rallying to Trump, but even having some of these kind of more serious rule of law, national security Republicans could make some difference. Linda, it's been pointed out that Trump was not charged for any of the documents that he returned to the National Archives upon request. He is only being charged for the ones he tried to hide and he obstructed justice on. If he had simply complied with the polite requests, many of them, and finally a subpoena for these documents, we would not be where we are. Now, a number of things, Nick just mentioned one of them, a a number of things in this indictment sort of refute some of the Republican talking points that we've been hearing, including the one about how Trump automatically declassified things when he took them up to the residence or when he took them to Mar-a-Lago. By his own words that are apparently caught on tape, he acknowledges that he didn't declassify these and that they were still secret. But another thing that this shows is that contrary to the other 
big talking point, namely that, oh, what about Hillary Clinton? She wasn't charged. And that means that this is unequal justice. That in point of fact, it was his obstruction. It was his arrogant refusal to comply that got him where he is. That's exactly right, Mona. And oh, by the way, we now have reporting that suggests that one of his own lawyers, one of the few that was demanding payment in advance of representing him, Mr. Kais, who is from Florida. Lee was a former solicitor for the state, and he advised former President Trump that if he wanted to, we could, in fact, set up a meeting and maybe talk to the Justice Department. Let's just return all of these documents and you won't be prosecuted. And this was well in advance of all of the drama that we have seen. We would not be here talking about this if he had followed the good, sound legal advice of his own lawyers, but he chose not to. And he chose not to, it seems, out of a sense of unbelievable entitlement that somehow these materials were his, his alone. You know, he he is the one who's going to save us. He's going to be our retribution. He's going to be this and that. Well, apparently all of the secrets, and we're talking about nuclear secrets, and as you suggested, battle plans. We're talking about exposing some of the most dangerous kinds of information to foreign adversaries, having them the way they were stored in a toilet, in a ballroom, uh, in hallways in which people could access. And it didn't matter. All he had to do was follow what his very well-paid, Mr. Keis is getting $3 million or got $3 million to represent Trump. If he'd simply taken the advice of his lawyers, we would not be here talking about this today. Right. And uh, not only that, if he hadn't tried to ask his lawyers to commit crimes on his behalf. Yes. Uh, Right. I mean, yes. And and there is that. Yes. There's this little matter, you know, all that you tell a lawyer is confidential unless you tell him when he's representing you on a bank heist. Oh, by the way, can you drive me over (laughs) to uh, the local Wells Fargo while I uh, slip in? And oh, by the way, I'm going to take some money out of that. I'm sure you won't mind. Yeah. And that is why we have the transcripts of Evan Corcoran's conversations with Trump, because he took careful notes and made recordings. And then a judge pierced the attorney-client privilege because of the crime fraud exception. So Bill Galston, one of the issues that, you know, again, thinking of this sort of in the long scheme of things, we've often talked on this show about how much the parties have changed. And, you know, there are so many examples, but Their support for arming Ukraine is a huge, huge example of the parties kind of flipping it. But here's another one, which is concern about national security. You know, it used to be that Republicans prided themselves on being the tough on national security party. And certainly as recently as 2016, Trump argued that his outrage over Hillary Clinton's cavalier use of a private server, which, by the way, I don't think she should have done, and I think was rightly a source of controversy. But in any case, what he has done is so much worse, so very much worse. And yet you have a number of people in the party saying, as long as Trump does it, it's okay. What else is new, Mona? (laughs) We can continue in this vein for quite some time. But in my judgment, it's irrelevant because the only thing that matters for the future of the country is how Trump's actions are being received and judged by the people who can either nominate him for a third run for president or refrain from doing so. There is zero evidence that Mr. Trump's support is weakening in any way in the face of multiple indictments. If anything, it's strengthening. Oh, it's really soon, Bill. I mean, it's only been a few days. You know what? I watched the Bulwark's Sarah Longwell's focus group on the news hour, and I defy anyone to listen to those focus groups and come to a conclusion other than the one that I have reached. And uh, and spell that out. What is that that you have reached? Well, they 
virtuously, virtu- <laughs> virtuously, right, virtually <laughs> unanimously, they think that Trump was set up. They think this is selective prosecution. They think that the FBI and the Justice Department have been totally politicized and quote unquote weaponized. They do not believe these charges. Wait, can I interrupt you for one sec, Bill? Yes. What was the screen for this focus group you're talking about? Was it two-time Trump voters or was it generally just Republican caucus goers? We're talking about Trump supporters. But that's a minority of the party. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, And if it's a minority, it's a 45% minority. Mm Mm-hmm look, I really think we have to face the facts. And I am intensely skeptical that anything that has happened in the past week or the past month, the past five years, the past eight years has weakened the fervor of support for Donald Trump inside the Republican Party in the slightest. Okay. And I see no evidence that he's not going to be renominated. Now, okay. you're right. It's early days, and maybe second thoughts will set in. But boy, second thoughts have had a long time to set in. Have they? Not at all. Okay. All right. So I'm going to now turn to Damon. And Damon, I'm going to make the case. I think Bill may be right that the party is at this point really dug in. But there's an alternate case to be made. So let's look at this in terms of how it's different. In the first place, as we said right at the start, you've got a number of prominent Republicans, including people who worked loyally for Trump, including Bill Barr, Mike Pence, Karl Rove, who didn't work for him, but worked with him, Jonathan Turley, Alan Dershowitz, Trey Gowdy, Britt Hume, sort of, Andy McCarthy, Ed Whalen, Judge Michael Ludig, they didn't all work for him, but these are all prominent Republicans. And I should also mention Asa Hutchinson, again, didn't work for Trump, but is a prominent Republican. He's running for president. Chris Christie, all of these people are speaking out very forcefully about this indictment. They are rebutting the big lies. In fact, Bill Barr even used the term big lie on Fox News. And so you do have something that we have not seen in the past eight years. We have not seen prominent Republicans team up and really go at him. And so that's one big difference. And the other is that the evidence in this indictment, yes, there will be a lot of people who are going to ignore it or say it was a setup or, you know, the hardcore Trump dead enders. Yes, nothing can persuade them. And Trump could do any crime and they would still support him. But that's not even the whole Republican Party. And it's certainly not the whole country. So your reaction? I am uh, afraid I'm on uh, Team Bill Galston here, Mona. Um, I don't see any evidence of this changing. And I also don't think it's true that we haven't seen this before. We saw it over and over again during the Trump administration. We saw it after the Access Hollywood tape in 2016. We saw it, for goodness sake, after January 6th. I think pretty much everybody you just listed went on the record as being extremely critical of Trump about what happened on January 6th, so much so that it seemed for a few days like they might actually impeach and convict the guy over it. But instead, it kind of got delayed and the actual trial didn't happen until a couple of weeks had gone by. And by then, Mitch McConnell and others in the Senate sort of got wishy-washy. And in the end, although more people voted to convict him then than they did in the first impeachment, we didn't end up with a conviction. And that is the pattern over and over again. Trump does outrageous things, and then people in the party, elected office holders or people who have held high appointed office, and then responsible commentators who should know better— break their silence and come out and say, whoa, this is really bad. And then they get their polling data from the field over the next few weeks and they see, oh, nobody is with me on this. I guess I have to sort of walk it back or drop it. And then things just revert. 
Now, if it turns out over the next month or so that when you look at the real clear politics line graphs of the aggregate polling and you actually see Trump starting to go down, I'll be the first person back here on the podcast to say, you know what? I was wrong. Mona, your optimism was correct. But I would say that so far there is zero evidence of that change. And it is a faith that I don't believe is what Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, would have called a rational faith. There simply is no empirical record to back up a situation like this actually leading the voters themselves to back down. Trump is between 50 and 55 percent in the Republican primary uh, tallies, about 30 points ahead of DeSantis. Until that starts to noticeably change, I'm just going to sit here and assume they just don't care. I'm so sorry, ma'am. I know you need this medicine, but it looks like it's not covered by your insurance. Yeah, unfortunately, I had to deny that one. Wait, who are you? I'm your insurance company's pharmacy benefit manager. I get paid based on the price of a medicine, and I don't make as much money off this one. No one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. Okay, it is now a categorical imperative that I turn back to Nick Grossman. Uh, You mentioned Kant. So, look, I understand, of course, what Damon and Bill are both saying, and I've said it myself many times, but look, I do think it's possible that this is a little different. So let me, again, try to lay it out. In the past, when Trump has done terrible things, I'm going to leave out 2016 because that was a time when his support, it was really, you know, flowering. But later on, you know, you would have occasional people, Senator Flake or Liz Cheney, or, you know, individuals would pop up and they would be picked off, you know, their heads above the parapets. And there was no sense of that Fox News viewers, for example, were getting any voices other than Trump voices. And I suspect that is changing a little bit. It may not be enough, but I do think it's notable. I mean, you've even had a weather vane like Nikki Haley sort of coming out and saying, at first she was, you know, just condemning the Justice Department for the indictment. Then she read it and she said, well, you know, he really was very reckless with our national security and I'm a military wife. You have Chris Christie in the race now. I think that changes things. He is very good at dominating headlines and very aggressive in the way he goes after Trump, which people were doubting whether he would do it. He's doing it. And don't you think that makes a difference? So I think it might make a little difference in the sense that it is good for people to be speaking the truth, for more people to be doing that. I think it's good that Chris Christie might be able to perhaps create some more openings or more encouragement for other Republicans. But I'm going to share Damon's cynicism in that I think we have seen this happen many times before. And that the only real difference now is that there is a Republican primary on. So we're seeing some people who would prefer, for example, Ron DeSantis, that are being more critical of Trump than they otherwise would. And that if Trump locks up the nomination, that a lot of them will fall in line or keep quiet. Or once again, remember that they think partisanship trumps any sort of principle or national security or other issues. And we're seeing the Trump supporters continue to support Trump. And when some of them who have been deeply committed to defending him in anything say, well, in response to this, that means I like him more, I frankly don't believe them. I think that that is just sort of something they're saying to kind of give people a middle finger. And it's and only because it's not that I don't believe them, it's that I think it is not possible for them to like him more because they're already (laughs) committed to it. And so when we have this norm that is being challenged about really fundamental American norm about rule of law and, you know, John Adams, ours is a government of laws, not of men, and Theodore Roosevelt with no man is above the law and uh, all the rest of it, that is the norm that's being directly challenged and that it is time for everybody to accept. It's past time for everybody to accept 
that the dominant faction of the Republican Party wants to challenge that norm, that they are trying to put Donald Trump above the law. They have decided that defending him matters more than things like U.S. national security and that this is their priority. And what that means is that then not of all Republicans, certainly, but that as long as the party is into it, that they're going to nominate him and then everybody else has to deal with it because the norm was never something like a former president is allowed to do whatever they want without consequence. The norm was always that former officials respect the law and respect U.S. national security. We saw this with Biden and Pence both returning their documents and cooperating. And we saw this with people like George H.W. Bush, who wanted to remain in the loop with classified intelligence, but respected the process throughout and treated it with respect and with care. And so the norm has already been grossly violated by Trump. And then we find ourselves in this unprecedented situation where no matter what the action is unprecedented, either the United States lets unprecedented crimes slide or the U.S. prosecutes those crimes. And this is the path that the Republican Party has chosen for us. At some level, I think we need to respect that choice and take it seriously. Okay. Linda Chavez, you wanted to make another point. Yeah, just quickly. I don't disagree that Donald Trump is likely to be the nominee of the Republican Party. But the election will not be decided by the Republican Party. It will be decided primarily by independents. And I think they are turned off on this. But the more important point is this is a matter of law. We have a grand jury, which was in Florida. I'm sure on that grand jury were individuals who had voted for Donald Trump or who liked Donald Trump. And while I know the old saw about, you know, the uh, prosecutor can get a uh, grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. Well, it wasn't a ham sandwich. It was a former president of the United States. And my guess is the case that was made to the grand jury was so compelling that even the people on that grand jury who might have been predisposed to Donald Trump were willing to vote to indict him. And he is soon, and not soon enough for me, but at some point he is going to face a jury of his peers. And on that jury are going to be people who are going to listen to the government's case. And I believe in the jury system. And I believe that you will, in fact, get a conviction. And then we will be faced with the delightful yes. prospect of a presidential candidate or possibly a president serving from prison. By the way, two more indictments are almost certainly coming down the pike, and that's the world we live in. Before we leave this topic, let me just quote friend of the podcast, David Frum, who had a pithy tweet this week that sums up part of the nature of our situation. He said, Trump's indictment doesn't make us look like a banana republic. It was Trump's presidency that made us look like a banana republic. All right. With that, let's turn to some of the other news of the week. Bill Galston, you wrote this week about the problem of inflation. It is down to 4% with all the crush of other news. It hasn't received a lot of attention, but this is its lowest level since March of 2021, so more than two years. And meanwhile, wages are now beating inflation. That hasn't been the case until now. Well, so my question to you is, is this a situation where the economic news is turning around in time to save the incumbent president or not? And I'm thinking of George H.W. Bush's term, where we were in a mild recession, things were getting better, toward election day, that news had not percolated down enough. People hadn't felt it enough in their own lives by the time the election came around. And so even though the recession was over, it wasn't perceived to be enough to save George H.W. Bush. Do you think this could be one of those situations? I believe that President Biden is in the danger zone, which is why I wrote the piece that I did. By the metrics that I use, the real purchasing power of wages and weekly earnings has been going down month by month for more than two years. And that, I think, is almost a silver bullet explanation for the sour mood that Americans are expressing about the economy. If inflation stays below 
the rate of wage increases so that there is a sustained period of purchasing power increases for average Americans, that will make a difference. And I think that President Biden has just enough time to have that make a difference in the evaluation of the economy under his management and therefore make a difference for his election prospects. But I would caution that the most recent month is the first time in more than two years that this has happened. And core inflation, taking out the most volatile elements, has been very, very sticky. If you look at that graph, it's come down by only one percentage point from about six and a half to about five and a half. And that is one of the measures that the Fed looks at more than it looks at headline inflation. You can make the argument that rental prices are already coming down and that will show up with a lag in the consumer price index. Uh, so you can tell a good story, but it has to be a sustained period of real income increases corrected for inflation. Otherwise, it won't make a difference. All right. So the Fed has already decided to suspend the latest rate increase. So they're clearly satisfied that this means something. No, I don't think that's right, Mona. No? Okay, explain. The Fed had a bit of a shock in recent months when the impact of rate increases on banks' balance sheets began, you know, yes. take effect. Yes. And you had you had a series of regional bank failures. And as Janet Yellen has recently said, there were widespread fears in the Fed and in the Treasury Department that it could be part of a larger financial destabilization as people began to take a hard look at the real value of the bank's reserves as opposed to the face value of those reserves. And so I think the Fed is not satisfied with its progress on inflation, but it is now having to balance a very important consideration that it didn't have to take into account six months ago or even three months ago. Right. Uh, and obviously, if inflation continues to recede, the Fed could decide to continue its pause, which would be very good news for all sorts of people, including the holders of equities and bonds. But that is a big if. Okay, let me just ask you one other follow-up, and that is, what do you propose that the Biden administration should do at this point about inflation other than talk about it? or recognize it as a sore point? Well, the president I worked for, Bill Clinton, said that when the public cares a lot about a problem, you may not be able to solve it, but you should do everything to make sure that you are caught trying to solve it. So let me give an example. My wife and I experience sticker shock every time we walk into a grocery store or supermarket. What has happened to food prices is really quite shocking. And let's take one of my favorite indicators, the steak indicator. You know, steak averaged $8 a pound two years ago. It's now at $10. That's a 25% increase. There are all sorts of reasons why this is happening, but it's not because the, the ranchers and farmers are getting rich. Uh, a couple of years ago, well, more than a couple of years ago, but within living memory, they were making $400 per head of cattle taken to market. As of last year, that figure was down to $12. If I were the Biden administration, I would assemble a very high visibility event, including everybody in, literally speaking, the food chain. And you know, I would put on the table, OK, if farmers aren't making money and consumers are paying much, much more than they used to, where is the money going? And really convinced the American people that the president and the entire administration are aware of the fact that they can no longer, you know, the ordinary people can no longer afford to eat as they used to. And they're downshifting and they have to be seen to be doing something about that, or at least aware, in touch with the public's everyday experience. I could go on, but I think that we need some real inflation showmanship here. Interesting. Okay, very good. I would also add 
There's always the tariff thing. You can cut tariffs. That would be an immediate help. But okay, let's turn to what's happening in Ukraine. We've been waiting for the spring offensive. It is now, I guess, the summer offensive. It's almost the summer. And it's tentative. They are sort of feeling their way. And I know, Nick Grossman, you've been following this very closely. What is your sense of how this is going? And I noticed that Putin, for the first time since this war began, has begun to like acknowledge reality and talk about how many tanks they've lost. And I haven't heard that before. Is that some sort of dawning grappling with reality on the part of Putin, do you think? It's hard to say with Putin how much that he says in public is him grappling with reality and how much is him trying to manipulate people or manage images. So I could see something like acknowledging some of these losses as he has been in an information bubble and he has been surrounded by people who are afraid to tell him bad news and they in turn have people below them who don't like telling them bad news and all the way down the chain. And so maybe he really didn't know, and or at least to some extent. On the other hand, he might also have a sense that the information is filtering down the frustrations to average Russians and that there are things like this group of Russian military bloggers that are having some influence and that he needs to placate them somewhat or play different factions across each other. So that part, I think, is hard to say. On the Ukrainian counterinsurgency itself, I have a very, I'm sorry, counteroffensive. You can see what I've been uh, teaching for years with Iraq and (laughs) Afghanistan. Right. Um, Counteroffensive for Ukraine that I have a very unsatisfying answer, which is I don't know and we don't know. The thing that we could see at first was for months, a bunch of Ukrainian what's called shaping operations, where they would do things behind the lines or just say mess with Russia. I'd put maybe some of the drone attacks in Russia in this camp that mess with them in some ways to make it where then prepare for the upcoming battle to shape conditions. And now what we're seeing is a lot of probing of they are trying to find where in these Russian lines can they get through? Where are they weak? And Russia also has multiple defensive lines and is seeing where's Ukraine really going to push? And they're both trying to get the other one to make a big commitment first so that then they can counter it. And so for a while, what we're going to see is combat losses as expected. The Ukrainians are trying something kind of like D-Day. They're trying a, I mean, you know, not amphibious, but they're trying a frontal assault against prepared defenses, which is very hard and uh, will be very costly even if it works. And we're going to see a lot of people, and already you're seeing various people declaring either big signs of success or big signs of failure. And I can tell you that those people either don't know what they're talking about or are rooting for one side and we're going to say that regardless. So as frustrating and weird as this may be as observers, especially since the stakes are so incredibly high that if Ukraine doesn't show something that could be called success it would probably be harder for them to continue getting the support from their various Western partners who want to back a winner, don't want to just throw more money and material at a futile effort that just leads to more people getting killed. And thus far, the Ukrainians have showed that they can make gains, but it's not going to look like it did with their successes last year because those are surprises and Russia is ready for this one. So with a very unsatisfying answer that it's clearly underway, but we'll have to really wait and see for a while, both success and failure will look the same. They'll both look like combat with losses and probings. Right. And it's always difficult for the attacker when, you know, the defender is dug in. There's that too. And and the Russians had all winter to prepare their defenses. Mm -hmm. So Linda, I know you've been following this also. It just Reading about the destruction of that dam and the devastation that was caused throughout that part of Ukraine, it just struck me again, not to be too obvious, but honestly, we hear talk about war crimes, but aggressive war itself is a crime against humanity. And it's just heartbreaking how much suffering the Ukrainian people have had to endure and will endure because Vladimir Putin's bloody-minded desire to obliterate Ukraine as an independent country. That's absolutely right. And unfortunately, uh, Ukraine depends so much on us and our Western allies uh, for help. 
And this is not what it was in the early days where everyone was glued to their TV set, where we were watching what was happening minute by minute. There is this big offensive going on, and it's not even the lead item on most newscasts. It's not the lead item in most newspapers. Unfortunately, uh, Donald Trump, in addition to all his other crimes, is driving the news and driving off the Americans' attention for this humanitarian crisis and these human rights uh, violations that are going on. So it's a very sad day, but I hope Nick is right. I hope that it's just a matter of waiting to see what's going to happen, but I do worry about American wavering support. Right, especially from Republicans. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, there's going to be a supplemental. The Biden administration is signaled that they're going to ask for more money, and we can't afford to lose too many more Republicans on this issue. Right. Okay. Nick, did you want to to have a quick follow up? Just a a quick follow up on Republicans. I think that. Russia can see this, that this is the sort of thing that they pay attention to. And while there have been a number of establishment Republicans, more old school kind of Reaganite Republicans like Mitch McConnell, who have stood by Ukraine and are standing up for U.S. partners and for democracy um, and the rest against a U.S. rival, but the Republican leaders, Donald Trump, and also to a decent extent, Ron DeSantis and their most influential media figures have been gradually pulling the party more and more towards opposition to aiding Ukraine. And that means it's likely that the Republican primary will pull the party even more towards that. You can see in the numbers about maybe 20% of Republicans were opposed to the aid at first, and now it's over 50%. And that is in large part because their leaders have been arguing it. So Russia can see this. And that means from Russia's perspective, it's a good reason to keep the war going through 2024 because they can't beat Ukraine on the ground. So their best bet is to try to get the West to back off. And maybe then Ukraine will be so scared that they'll cut a deal. And from Russia's perspective, they can see that the U.S. is potentially going to flip. None really of the Europeans will. But if America flips then, it's smart for Russia to keep the war going through then. And for that, among other reasons, I'd expect it to likely go for at least another year. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I would only add that the only ray of light here is that Putin's very best ally in the American media, Tucker Carlson, has lost his perch. Mm -hmm. So there is that. All right. So- This week, we had two Republican presidential candidates, Mike Pence and Ron DeSantis, say that they think the renaming of the Fort Bragg, which was named after Braxton Bragg, a Confederate general, changing the name to Fort Liberty, was political correctness, and that they think this is run amok, and that if they get in, they're going to reverse this. And I am very offended by this, but I think, Damon, you have a different view. So why don't you tell us how you see it? Yeah, I mean, this is one of these cases where I'm going to try to, as the Republicans might say, weaponize my ambivalence. Um, They love using (laughs) weaponize these days. There isn't one ounce of me that has the least bit of nostalgia for the Confederacy. I consider the Confederacy to be a massive movement of traitors to everything that makes America great and ever has. I have no sympathy for people who look back with kind of keen memories and imagination imagination about that era and what the South did. But I do have some sympathy for people who just sort of want the kind of background assumptions of their daily lives to remain sort of static. So if you are in the military or you work near Fort Bragg or deal with it in your work in any way, that's just what this place is called. It's Fort Bragg. It always has been since you were young. And then one day it gets renamed. And that I think, to use a term that gets overused a lot in our culture, but it triggers them. It makes them say, wait a minute, why is this place that was called Fort Bragg? Most of them probably don't even know who it was named after. It was just Fort Bragg. Why is this now called something else? Who decided this? Did you ask my elected representatives whether to do this? And if you did, why did they not come to us and ask? I know (laughs) that that is often the process where it happens. But the problem is that it leads a lot of people to get a feeling as if 
these background assumptions of our public life are sort of constantly shifting and changing in order to kind of make up for moral deficits from our past. In a fair number of these cases, I'm on the side of the change, but I still sort of wish that our leaders and uh, people in power would simply defer a little bit more to uh, an assumption that People just sort of want things to remain as they are, and there is no reason in a lot of these cases to actually make a change just for the sake of demonstrating a kind of moral fastidiousness. So I feel a little bit after the talk of inflation and Ukraine that I'm commenting on a bit of a triviality, but why give DeSantis and Pence this kind of silly softball issue to demagogue about? How about just keep the, the military? base named what it was and talk about something more important. That's sort of my, again, ambivalent reaction to this. It seems like something unimportant that we, we don't need to be doing. Okay. Linda, what do you think? Well, I beg to differ <laughs> with my friend and colleague, Damon, and it has to do really with how these bases got named after these Confederate generals in the first place. It all had to do with Jim Crow. It all had to do with trying to woo support. And I think many of them were right around the time of World War I. And there was some concern that the South somehow would not endorse, I guess, America's involvement in that war. Uh, but there were a lot of racists who were involved in naming these bases. And I absolutely agree with Damon when it comes to a lot of the renaming we're doing. I mean, Woodrow Wilson. I, hey, I don't have any great love for Woodrow Wilson as a president but renaming Woodrow Wilson High School here in Washington, D.C., where one of my children went to school. I think we can do without that. But these are army bases. We had a vote by the United States Congress that established a commission, and that commission made recommendations for changes. While each and every one of them might not be followed, it seems that Bragg, who was, by the way, supposedly not a very good general, he was somebody who fought against the United States of America. We don't see honoring, you know, our uh, Japanese adversaries or our German adversaries in World War II uh, naming bases after them. I think it was the right thing to do. And oh, by the way, Republicans, at least in the voice vote that was taken in the committee, voted, um, many of them voted for this commission that said we should rename. Yeah, I agree with Linda. In the case of naming things after Confederate generals, yeah, that's just a bridge too far. And we, you know, we have to bear in mind that these are army bases and that in order to have an effective fighting force, we have to have people from all backgrounds, including African Americans, feel comfortable and feel honored. And to expect them to just overlook that they are uh, serving in a place named after a Confederate is, I think, too much. By the way, in Arlington County, Virginia, right across the river from Washington, D.C., they renamed Lee Highway. Recently, they named it Langston after the first elected African-American in Virginia. And that's welcome. By the way, it hasn't been Lee Highway since the Civil War. It was named that, as Linda implied, in 1922, which was at the height of the power of the Ku Klux Klan in this country. So anyway, I'm all for eliminating Confederates from positions of honor. <laughs> okay, with that, I think we can now turn to our last segment, Highlight or Low Light of the Week. And I'll turn to you first, Bill Galston. I'd like to highlight two contributions from a scholar that I haven't cited up to now. His name is Hal Brands. He is more conservative than I am. Uh, he's at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the American Enterprise Institute. But you know, within the past week or so, he's done two things that have really come to my attention in a favorable way. First, he wrote a short piece for Bloomberg arguing that there was a flat-out incompatibility between the trajectory of defense spending incorporated into the recent debt ceiling agreement on the one hand and any reasonable accounting of what it's going to take to maintain our position in Europe and especially in Asia 
in the face of mounting threats. The defense budget now is on a trajectory to shrink in real terms. And it's just a flat out contradiction and serious foreign policy people, serious lawmakers are going to have to grapple with that. Second, and much more impressively and even timelessly, he recently edited a thick volume of essays entitled The New Makers of Modern Strategy. This is a volume that has been published and re-edited a number of times, and it is a treasury of high-quality analysis of war and its relationship to other areas of policy. And it's something I'll be dipping into for the rest of my career as a scholar. I commend it highly. It's a real achievement. Okay, Linda Chavez. Well, I'm going to uh, make a highlight this week, and it's an article written by Karen Tumulty in the Washington Post. And it's really a rather long profile of the mayor of Dallas, And the headline sort of says it all. The headline of the article was, America's big cities are seeing a crime surge, not Dallas, thanks to its mayor. And the mayor in that case is a Democrat. His name is Eric Johnson. He has been reelected. He's got sky high approval, 77%. And, you know, that's not that unusual, I guess, in a big city with a Democratic mayor. He also happens to be African-American. But this mayor has made fighting violent crime a centerpiece in his uh, administration. He fired a black chief of police, replaced her with another chief, and that chief happened to be Hispanic. Crime has come down. Violent crime has come down in Dallas rather than going up. And this is all in the face of considerable early protest by Black Lives Matter, who actually used to come and protest outside his house. This is a guy who really seems to know what he's doing, is doing a great job in the city of Dallas, and is defying a lot of our stereotypes about Democratic uh, big city mayors. Great. Thank you. Damon Linker. My recommend this week just might lead to even more big to differing around here. I'm going to do something (laughs) that I've never done in my career, and that is recommend an essay by leftist writer Naomi Klein, who has a long essay in The Guardian titled Beware, We Ignore Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s Candidacy at Our Peril. You can tell she has some sympathy for some things that RFK stands for, but it is a really, I think, shrewd and tough-minded analysis. It has lots of links to crazy, wild stuff that he said down through the years. And it also includes a really excellent, tough critique of his kind of ridiculous position on what he claims is the connection between changes in the vaccine schedule for kids and the rise of rates of autism. But the reason I bring this up is because I agree with her in that headline that we do need to take his candidacy seriously. Not that he's going to depose Joe Biden for the Democratic nomination, but he is consistently polling somewhere between 12 and 20 percent on the Democratic side. But the fact that he can get even that much while at the same time generating a little bit of excitement on the right as well, not only uh, nihilist troublemakers like Steve Bannon and Roger Stone and also Tucker Carlson, by the way, have all said nice things about him. But you do get the sense that on the right, there is a kind of general a warm feeling for the guy, and not just because he might be making Biden's job a little harder, because he is a conspiracist. One thing that has changed in American politics since Trump's ascent in 2016 is the rise of a, a kind of receptiveness to conspiracy theories in our public life. Kennedy, maybe, you know, name recognition probably has something to do with his numbers, but I would be watching them. Some have even speculated what we really need to see is a Trump-Kennedy ticket, an all-populist, all-conspiracy 
cross-partisan ticket. I don't think that's going to happen, but I do have a Substack post coming up soon that will explore that possibility and why some people are talking about it. It is a problem, a danger, something that worries me, but it is a real thing that I think we need to be thinking about is why is it happening? What can be done to thwart it? And Naomi Klein has written a piece that advanced my thinking on that issue a bit. Thank you so much. Okay, Nick Grossman. My pick is the TV show, The Americans, which my wife and I just recently finished watching. So it's not brand new, but uh, we finished watching it and absolutely loved it. I think that it it's about, for those that don't know or haven't heard of it, it's about some 1980s era Soviet spies in deep cover pretending to be Americans in the Washington, D.C. area. And I think it belongs on the list of great prestige television with shows like The Sopranos and The Wire and Breaking Bad. It's you know, so well acted and well written. And especially the last season is truly fantastic. And the um, reason also why I bring it up in this context is because it ended up being a odd show to watch from the perspective of today rather than from the uh, 2010s when it was being filmed. And because so much has changed in the relationship with Russia, that there are parts that made me quite sad. Just that, for example, in later seasons, there's one uh, character, a KGB character, who is um, back in Russia, and they filmed him on the streets in Moscow. They shot on location in Moscow. And when is that going to happen again? Mm -hmm. You know, when would somebody be able to do that? And uh, part of towards the end of the show deals with the time of, of Gorbachev and opening up and all these possibilities for the future. And so many of those possibilities have been closed off. And so in a way, there's something that was optimistic towards the end of the show of there's a faction that is a KGB faction, the hardliners trying to prevent the opening up of the Soviet Union and they lose. And in a way, looking at it now, seeing Putin in charge and having launched this aggressive war against Ukraine, maybe that faction ended up kind of winning in the long run. And so it both changed the perspective on the show, but I would recommend it to everybody because as much as it's about that spy stuff. And that part's very thrilling. And, you know, it's Hollywooded up, uh, of course. More stuff happens to them than would happen to real spies, even though the tradecraft on it is probably better than most Hollywood depictions I've seen. There's an awful lot of murders. Oh, yeah. Way, <laughs> way more murders. Like <laughs> Actual spies, when they actually had people like that, they would keep their head down, right. you know, not kill anybody. So that part's Hollywooded up, sure. But the show is fundamentally about a marriage. And so I think even if someone is not all that into the spy stuff, that the part about a marriage with the spy stuff, making it as intense as possible, heightening normal marriage things like, should we send our kid off to school outside of the state, you know, for example. So uh, the Americans, I recommend it to everybody. It was great. Yeah, I thought so too. And so did I. I want to yeah. weigh in too. Great, great yeah. show. It's fabulous. You forgot to mention the music. The music in it is great. <laughs> mm-hmm. Both the score and the real songs that they met, that they licensed for it are great. And to be clear, they have children and they're raising their children as ordinary Americans. And then they face certain conflicts like their kids wanting to go to Christian camp. <laughs> and here they are, these good Bolsheviks. Anyway, it, it is very good. By the way, the actress who starred in that, whose name is escaping me right now. Carrie Russell. Carrie Russell mm -hmm. is also the star of a new show that I recommend called The Diplomat. So, And there's only one season of that so far, but it's been renewed. It's fantastic. So, okay. Thanks for that. And I would like to highlight a piece by Idris Kaloun, a brilliant young writer for The Economist magazine, but this is a piece he did for The New Yorker title, Economists Love Immigration, Why Do So Many Americans Hate It? And it is a very learned discussion of how immigration has featured in American history, it goes back a fair uh, number of years and, and chronicles our perennial struggles with inclusion and exclusion, he talks about his own family history, where he grew up in Kansas, I believe, his parents came from uh, Pakistan. And he has some very balanced observations about how good immigration is for the economy, and that's why economists love it, but that there are complications. And the perception of being overrun by foreigners is something you have to take seriously in any country. And uh, anyway, it's just a very balanced, interesting, illuminating essay on the whole subject of immigration. So I recommend it. And with that, I want to thank our guest, Nicholas Grossman, who you can find at Arc Digital and on Twitter. 
And I want to thank our regular panel, as well as our producer, Katie Cooper, and our sound engineer, Jonathan Siri. Beg to Differ will be back next week, but I will not. We have a guest host because I'm taking some time off, but we will return next week as every week. Thank you so much. The Bulwark Podcast focuses on political analysis and reporting without partisan loyalties. A real sense of deja vu sprinkled on our PTSD. So things are going well, I guess. Every Monday through Friday, Charlie Sykes speaks with guests about the latest stories from inside Washington and around the world. You document in a very compelling way all of the positive things that have come out of this, but it also feels like we have this massive hangover. No shouting or grandstanding. Principles over partisanship. The Bulwark Podcast, wherever you listen.